Hey, I'm Tamara Kendacker, and you're listening to The Decibel from The Globe and Mail. So Lebanon's been going through a financial crisis that's destroyed its economy for two years. And things have gotten so bad that the country's leader is warning of a coming social explosion. Meanwhile, the World Bank has ranked it one of the worst depressions in modern history. Frequent blackouts, lines for gas that wrap around city blocks, people struggling to get their hands on medicine and all kinds of imported goods, as well as cash, which has lost more than 90% of its value since 2019. More than half the population in Lebanon now lives in poverty. Prime Minister Hassan Diab has been in charge in a caretaker capacity since his cabinet resigned after the explosion at the port in Beirut last year. And he's been pleading with the international community for help. But the countries that Lebanon could usually count on are saying no, that this is a crisis of Lebanon's own making, and that the country needs to get its affairs in order before they can hope for any kind of aid, leaving a lot of Lebanese people feeling like there's no way out. It's all about corruption. At the end of the day, Lebanon is where it is because of corruption. Mark McKinnon is the Globe's senior international correspondent, and I called him up in Beirut. Today on The Decibel, what things look like on the ground in Lebanon, how we got here, and what, if any, is the way forward. Let's get into it. Hi, Mark. Welcome back. Thank you for having me. So you just came back from the main hospital in Beirut. What was that like? Yes, I spent most of today at the Rafi Kariri University Hospital here in Beirut. Um, Frankly, it was quite an emotional experience. Um, I started out meeting with the CEO of the hospital, um, just meeting with um, doctors and nurses at different levels of the of, of the hospital and, and listening to what what they don't have. And mm-hmm. this is a hospital that, like the rest of the city, now only gets supplied two or three hours of electricity per day. Um, so they have to work off generators, and generators run off fuel, and the country is running short on fuel. So the hospitals ha- are constantly sending people to go stand in line to buy more fuel. They're out of medicines. Mm-hmm. They're out of the ability, the reagents that are needed to conduct uh, the tests that you would do normally to come to a hospital. So they're down to doing only about 20% of the tests. And so doctors are receiving people in the emergency room and basically saying, you know, how badly does this person need to be treated? Because we really can't afford to to spare any medicine right now. On top of that, the pressures, as you can imagine, of being a frontline mm-hmm. hospital in an in a economic crisis, in a pandemic, the staff are in tears, they're overworked, and most of their colleagues are leaving. And so you have mm-hmm. a diminishing number of doctors and nurses dealing with a growing number of patients as this country falls into into poverty in the middle of a pandemic. Wow, this sounds dire. I've also been following your Twitter feed and you've been tweeting out your observations outside of the hospital. And, and tell me what you've been, what else you've been seeing. Well, that, just being here, I, I lived uh, briefly in Beirut for a few months a long time ago trying to learn Arabic. This is a place that I know quite well. I was here, um, been re- here repeatedly through the last 16 years since then. Mm-hmm. And it's always been a city that frankly was quite fun to visit. I love coming to Beirut. But I've never seen it like this. The, even when I was here in the, when Israel and Hezbollah had the war in 2006 and I was in Lebanon, there were always parts of the society that were strangely unaffected by it. There was this bizarre Lebanese joie de vivre that is almost unshakable. And I think it's been shaken. Mm-hmm. People who had the money they had two years ago, the, the currency collapses cost them 92% of whatever they had. You know, the electricity is only on for a fraction of the day. So people are up sweating in the middle of the night because they can't sleep. Mm-hmm. There are lineups hours long to buy gasoline for cars, and those are getting angry. As you can imagine, it's 30 degrees outside. People spend two hours to three hours in line. You get to the front of the line, and there's no gas. People are pulling guns out in these situations and demanding that they get fuel. And, of course, this is a country that has a, a deeply troubled past. They're, you know, It's not that long ago that uh, Lebanon had a, had a decades-long civil war, and, that, and that's in the background. People are extremely, extremely tense. And and, um, and it's it, it comes from the financial crisis, which comes from the political crisis. And so you mentioned these fights that have been breaking out. And Hassan Diab, the caretaker prime minister of Lebanon, he had a meeting on Tuesday with diplomats and he's calling on the international community to save the country. And he said the country is days away from a social explosion. Is that what he was referring to? What did he mean by that? 
I think that is what he's referring to. There is a sense for sure that some minor incident like that, like somebody pulling a gun out of the gas station, which frankly has happened four or five times in the last uh, week or so, could escalate. A lot of people in this country have weapons. There's a deep sectarian divisions between the Sunni and the Shia and the Christians and the various factions of Christians here in the in, in the country. And, and you can see how an argument about who gets gas um, can escalate. And people need that gas because that's how they power their generators. That's how they're going to keep their fridge running. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing that's running out right now is, is baby milk. It's really extremely hard to come by. So people are, are desperate. People are angry. It's hot. And... Um, there's not a lot left to lose is another thing that people have said to me. And um, those that can leave are leaving. Those that can stay are just expected to get worse. You mentioned that the value of the currency has plunged. And the World Bank has said that Lebanon's financial crisis is one of the worst three since the mid-1800s in terms of the way that it's impacted living standards. So can we explain how this happened? Like, How did the financial crisis get to this point? There's the shortish answer, which begins two years ago, and then there's the longish answer. And I think the longish answer is important to go through. Um, at the end of the Civil War, uh, Lebanon's warring factions came to a peace agreement known as the Taif Accords, which basically divided power between these various sects. The Sunnis are always the prime minister, the Shias are always the speaker of parliament, the Christians have the presidency, but that goes through every institution. They're all divided up into to make sure that no confessional group feels um, it's being, doesn't have a voice. What that did, unfortunately, is it gave the Civil War warlords sort of a, a stake in, the, you know, uh, what was supposed to be a stake in the country, but it turned out they, it gave them an ownership of part of the country. And the short answer is that as part of this arrangement, as part of this rebuild Lebanon that we that took place in the in the 1990s, the currency was, was pegged at an artificial rate of 1,500 Lebanese pounds to the dollar. And this was always low. And it um, encouraged a, a, a borrowing spree, which you know, helped, helped rebuild Lebanon after the Civil War, and, and also financed um, a lifestyle in the country that was always beyond its means. People were importing everything, uh, paying import rates at, because of the, uh, the low exchange rate. And then what happened is, is we were always heading towards this crisis. And um, about two years ago, the um, central bank, which had been basically funding the, the government's uh, spending spree, ran out of dollars. And then it turned mm-hmm. to the private banks who began funding the central bank um, until they also ran out of dollars. And um, we ended up in this situation. I was speaking with an economist this afternoon who said, it's not that we're short $3 billion or $5 billion, as, as big as those amounts are. It's closer to $60 billion. That's just not there in terms mm-hmm. of depositors have put this money in the bank thinking that they could eventually take out U.S. dollars and they have they can't get it. And so now you're in a situation where the real exchange rate has gone from, you know, two years ago, if I came in here and I changed a U.S. dollar on the street, I'd get 1,500 uh, Lebanese pounds back. Today it's closer to 18,000. And so uh, while that's great if you're a tourist coming to Lebanon right now, it's it's devastating if you live here and that's what you're, you know, the value of, of your holdings in the bank account, the value of, of everything you own has fallen by 90% in the last two years. It's just spiraling and like hyperinflation sort of comparisons are being made mm-hmm. to, to Venezuela, to Zimbabwe. So Lebanon is in a debt crisis. It's one of the most indebted countries in the world. And, and why is that? Why have they borrowed so much money? Um, that's a good question. I mean, and this gets you know, to what uh, a little bit cuts to what Mr. Uh, Mr. Diab was saying. The acting prime minister was was saying when he was at, telling these foreign ambassadors, you know, please help Lebanon. All the way through this era, various outside powers have been very happy to lend money to their factions, to their the politicians they support in Lebanon. So there's all sorts of uh, money coming in. There's also the Lebanese central bank made a policy of keeping interest rates. Um, extremely high in the country. So there was an incentive for people outside the country to, to put their money. In. So you know, there was just a borrowing spree that the country went on. And this is why levies are so angry is you can't actually say what it is funded. You do not see the infrastructure here. You don't have, mm-hmm. there's not a brand new subway. There's not a beautiful sort of redeveloped harbor. It's gone. But you know, the, at some point now, it's time to, to pay it back and there's no money to pay it back. Okay, so can I just summarize my understanding of this and and just like let me know if 
the way that I'm understanding it is correct. So Lebanon came out of the civil war and had to pay for its reconstruction. They started borrowing money from their own banks. And now the banks have basically run out of money and there is no infrastructure to speak of. And that money has disappeared. Yes. And and in the past, when we got to these moments, outside countries, France, the United States, um, Saudi Arabia, often would ride to the rescue and, or, you know, via the, and provide more money to Lebanon. This time, and this is where the geopolitics come in, there's, there's a bit of a Lebanon fatigue, and it's tied to the political problems, you know, helping, paying into a system that benefits Hezbollah. So they, they'd like to see almost a deal struck that would sort of see Hezbollah back off some of its activities in places like Yemen and Iraq and, and stop being sort of a, a threat at the Israeli border. And of course, Hezbollah is not going to do any of that. And, and, and the, the geopolitics of the crisis came very clear recently when Hezbollah said, listen, if you guys can't bring fuel into the country soon, we're going to start bringing in Iranian fuel in, in violation of U.S. sanctions. And that's, that's probably an empty threat, but that's, you know, it's, it's kind of saying to the West, like, if you don't keep paying like you always have, we're going to go even more towards mm-hmm. Iran which is you know, where you start to see the, the geopolitical chessboard. So the World Bank has called this the deliberate depression. Do you think that that's an accurate description? And yet the government refuses to change course because even at this moment, the economic crisis continues to serve these warlords. What I mean by that is they have their dollars in Switzerland. Those dollars are worth more and more here. People are getting poorer and poorer because the value of their incomes have fallen. The, the, these warlords can go to France or to Switzerland, get their, bring their dollars back in, and they can use that to buy a loyalty. Can we look, the government collapsed, but here I am. I'm going to fund the school next year. I'm going to rebuild this hospital. I'm going to set up a, fo- uh, um, a food bank here in the town. And so they will gain loyalty, but it also is leading to an increasing discussion of whether Lebanon can remain a single state or whether we're heading towards a less violent, um, because no one's really talking about a civil war at this point, but a division of the state where there's a Christian area, there's a Sunni area, there's a Shia area, maybe Beirut's the fourth part of this, and people just sort of basically, like like Bosnia-Herzegovina as an example, sort of the state sort of disintegrates into these um, sort of sectarian sections. explain what corruption has to do with this and what the nature of the corruption is? It's all about corruption. At the end of the day, Lebanon is where it is because of corruption. And the nature of that corruption is that sectarian system that was set up in the 1990s where um, every single public service job was handed out along the lines of confessional lines. And so you were given... If you wanted to advance in the banking industry, if you wanted to advance um, in the Port Authority, to pick another recent example, you had to sort of, uh, that job was given to you in exchange for your loyalty by the higher ups in your political party, whether that was Christian, Sunni, Shia or whatever. And so at every level, it it just became endemic. Um, It's not the kind of corruption where you're paying bribes on the street, but it's it's the corruption where to get a a government contract, you had to cut in, you know, the, the head of your sect. You know, only this week, 30 years after the peace deal was signed in Lebanon, did they pass a law regulating how government contracts should be handed out. And the only reason that's being mm-hmm. done now is because there's no more government contracts to hand out. Hmm. So this has been going on for a long time. But almost a year ago, there was the explosion at the port in Beirut. And what kind of impact do you think that had on the situation? Yeah, the the economic crisis is two years old. It's almost one year ago, the port explosion. We're at 11 months on from that. And, you know, obviously that did a few things. It it devastated this neighborhood that I'm in. This uh, is Jamezi that I'm in right now, which is the neighborhood that was most badly hit. The other thing it did, and mm-hmm. this is the big thing I've noticed, I, w- I was here right after the explosion um, and, and many times before that, as I said, and it, it's people gave up after that explosion. They, there were a lot of... Very talented Lebanese said, you know what, this country is broken beyond repair. And they left. Finally, after talking about leaving for a long time, they left. They've gone to Canada, they've gone to France, they've gone to Dubai. And that's accelerating now, obviously. The, uh, um, anybody who can go, frankly, is going. 
at the hospital I was at this morning, the um, head nurse said that they'd had 40 people leave, 40 nurses leave in the last month. Yeah, yeah, that would have a huge impact. So right after this explosion, Hassan Diab's cabinet resigned, and this was August 2020, that Lebanon still has this caretaker government. And why haven't they been able to form a new government? It's amazing to think that Hassan Diab is still here um, after that explosion, after he sort of symbolically resigned. And as we're speaking, there are meetings happening in Beirut where they're trying to form a government, but no one has great expectations for that because to get a government right now, you need to agree on an economic policy. And there are, there are two courses that Lebanon can take. One is it can agree to a package of very difficult reforms that the International Monetary Fund would like to see them take. That include letting the currency float and adopting a a series of difficult other Mm -hmm. choices uh, to reform their banking system, or they can stay on the current course. And you have a sort of phalanx of pro-Western politicians who, let's be fair, have been equally guilty of of the corruption uh, over the last few decades, but who have been broadly convinced by their sponsors, uh, if you want to call their sort of supporters in France and the United States that, that they need to do these reforms in order to get the money that's required to keep Lebanon's from complete free fall, or they can stay on their current course. And there are the other faction, which is broadly affiliated with Hezbollah and President Michel Aoun, who's a, um, a Christian, but who works with Hezbollah. They're just not ready to make these concessions. And, the, and they're looking to Iran, to China, hoping one of them will throw Lebanon a lifeline. But um, mm-hmm. I'm not sure that China or Russia is terribly interested in investing in Lebanon either right now. So basically, what's happening is that the political leadership can't agree to what the West is asking for. And if they did, they would get aid from the international community. And meanwhile, Lebanese people are suffering because these political leaders can't agree. It's more dire than that, in that they're, they're never going to agree. The dominant political force here, Hezbollah, is not going to agree to these conditions because it would be like they, they brand themselves as the resistance. They're here to fight Israel. You know, the, you might get some token concessions regarding the formation of some technocratic government, but the fundamental reforms that are required here, the undoing of the sectarian system, it's a threat to everybody who's in power. If you undo the mm-hmm. sectarianism, then all of them, all of these groups lose their influence. You might have something like a popular government rise up. Uh, you might have an alternative political party that isn't strictly Christian or Sunni or Shia um, emerge. And that's a threat to everybody who currently has their paws on power here. Mm -hmm. You mentioned people are leaving. Could this be a recipe for a refugee crisis like the one that we've seen in Venezuela? It could be. I mean, the the Lebanese who are leaving so far are those who have a a passport. Mm -hmm. So it's not a refugee crisis so much as it is is a crippling brain drain that's occurring. If you're a Mm -hmm. poor Lebanese... Um, as as, as the, the taxi driver I, I was wor- working with today said to me, he said, where can I go? Can I, should I go to Syria? I mean, if you look at Lebanon geographically, mm-hmm. Israel's border is sealed. So there's the Mediterranean Sea, which is being patrolled by warships. There's Syria. There's nowhere to go. People are, you know, they're retreating into their, mm-hmm. into their sex, into their hometowns, um, looking for security and collective support. Again, um, turning to these warlords who caused the problem in the first place. So this sounds like a pretty hopeless situation. How can the country get out of this predicament? I've asked that, and I've never, many times this week, and I've never gotten a terribly optimistic answer. Um, Hopefully there's something we don't see coming down the pipeline. But again, this is a crisis that's been years in the making, and everybody's seen it coming, and no one's been able to agree on on a path forward. So that's why people are leaving. this, this afternoon, I was speaking to the, the chief pharmacist at the Rafi Kariri Hospital, and you know she just she was in tears as she explained to me the medicines they're missing and w- what it means in terms of the um, her own brother-in-law had just died because um, he couldn't get the uh, heart medication he required, and she was telling me about a, a child who had been bitten in the face by a dog, and there's no more rabies vaccines. So. Um, she said, we're, the tears were streaming down her face. She said, we're past anger. You know, we were angry two years ago when we took to the streets and the, the, there was an uprising against the system two years ago that was, was squashed. Um, and she said, now we're, we're just into 
depression. We're all trying to leave. It's um, you know, and 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 she's one of the people. She's a nurse. She's educated. She stayed here a very long time. Mm-hmm. Long past many of her colleagues, but I think at this point she told me she's also filling out her papers to move to Canada. Mark, thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right, that's it for today. I'm Tamara Pendacker. Our producers are Madeline White and Kasia Mihailovich. David Crosby edits the show. Angela Pachenza is our executive editor. Thank you so much to Mark McKinnon. You can follow him on Twitter at Mark McKinnon. As always, if you want to email us, we're at thedecibel at globeandmail.com. If you want to reach me, I'm on Twitter at anima underscore TK. If you haven't followed us wherever you're listening, do that so you don't miss any episodes. And if you haven't already, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for listening. And just to let you know, we're not going to be publishing episodes on Fridays for the rest of July and August, but we are working on some good episodes for you. So I'll talk to you next week. <laughs>